So as you know, the Bible was written over 1,400 years by 40 authors in different continents, in three different continents, and over that much time period, as I mentioned. So chronology is something that we should aim to understand. So what I'm going to do is, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to go through the Old Testament, this chart, but don't keep looking at this chart because I'm going to give you the chart in a very narrative form, not in a technical form, but more in a narrative form. So basically, this is what happened in the Old Testament. Actually, I'd like to call it the First Testament, and the New Testament is the Second Testament. It's not really old and new. It's the first and the second, but people have named it that way, so it's stuck, so whatever. So what happened is, as you know, in Genesis, God created Adam and Eve. This is the story of the Old Testament. I wanted to show you a book called The Story. How many are aware of that? The Story is a, is a paraphrase by Max Lucado and Randy Frazee where the Bible is written in the form of a narrative or a story. And that is indeed the absolute correct way to start understanding the Bible. The Bible is a story. It's really the story of God and the story of God reaching man and woman to represent himself and ultimately become one with himself. But what happened is the story didn't have such a smooth flow. It got interrupted in the Garden of Eden, as you know. So what happens is the storyline starts perfect, where God created everything. Everything was good. And then sin entered the world. And so <coughs> in, in Eden, because of sin, there was a separation between God and human. Now, if the separation had not been there, you know the ending of the story is God would have brought them into union at the end in perfect harmony with creation. And that's how it would have ended. But that's not what happened. There was a cut or separation. So now the storyline changed. Because of the separation, God, God's plan now changed, or in other words, this plan was already in place, but you see this plan coming to pass now. And God's plan now is about bridging that gap, okay? So closing that separation. So you have to understand, the Bible is about God and God alone, and then God and his creation, and now there's a separation. Now the Bible is about God bridging this gap. So in one word, in one sentence, that's what the Bible is about. So let's continue. And so what happens is Adam sinned, fell, and then there was sin, there was destruction, and then God, again, picked one man, just like he did in the beginning, Adam. He picked Abraham. And just like through Adam, God wanted to bring himself to the world. Now through Abraham, God wants to bring himself to the world. What did God say to Abraham? Through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Okay, so it's the same story, different character. So Abraham comes in the picture. God blesses Abraham and they multiply, they become the nation of what? Israel. Again, timeline. Through Adam, God wanted to bless. Interrupted. Through Abraham, God wanted to bless. They went into captivity. Say so they became the nation of Israel. So now God, through Israel, God wanted to bless. Right? Do you remember the promise God gave to Abraham? He wants to bless all the nations through you. So now through Israel, the plan never changes. It's the same concept. God wants to bless the world through Israel. But what happened to Israel? When they came into the promised land, they, instead of becoming the people who bless others, what did they do? They mixed with all the other nations and they polluted themselves. And now that plan of blessing has been interrupted by the disobedience of the people. So if you notice, this is important to understand about Israel because Israel in the time of David and Solomon was one kingdom, right? But then what happened after Solomon? You have Rehoboam and Jeroboam, two sons, and the kingdom splits into two. So you see how, okay, Adam and then Abraham and then Israel 
and then Israel becomes two, the northern kingdom. This is not NK for North Korea, by the way. And SK, southern kingdom. Okay, so you got the northern kingdom, which had 10 tribes, which is when in the diagram, it'll say northern kingdom, Israel, dash 10. Southern kingdom is known as Judah, which has two, which is the tribe of Judah and then Benjamin. So you got two for the southern kingdom and then 10 for the northern kingdom. Here's the funny thing. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, remember, they were all supposed to be a blessing. But the northern kingdom disobeyed, and so God caused the northern kingdom to go into captivity, chains. So who did, the God, who did God use to take them captive? Assyria. So this happened in 700 and, I think, 740-something B.C., Okay, so Assyria came to take them captive, and they took this kingdom away. No plan coming through the northern kingdom. So you would think that now God would use the southern kingdom to bring about that blessing, right, from the beginning. So what did the southern kingdom do? You think they would learn from the mistake of the northern kingdom? No. So what did they do? They disobeyed, and they also went into captive, but they lasted a little bit longer than them. And so what happens here, this is what you have to understand. So just like we understand Israel in terms of theology, we have to understand Israel in terms of politics or political condition in the world. So politically speaking, when the northern kingdom was taken captive, Assyria was the main power. All right. So then what happened was the Assyrian power weakened and who came into the world stage? Babylon, the Babylonians. So when Southern kingdom rebelled. God used Babylon to take them into captivity. And this happened around 586 B.C. So, wow. Look, about, look at this. Adam, Abraham, Israel split both of them into captive. Now they're all gone into exile. So the thing you need to understand is this. So in history, you'll see the historical books talk about the kings of Israel you will see, the, uh, for example, Chronicles and Kings. They're talking about this time period when there's northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Everybody's obeying. They're disobeying. They're obeying. They're disobeying. So you have that big interruption there. So that's what the historical books is all about. Then you have the prophetic books, right? What are the prophetic books? Anybody? Starting with Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations, and then the minor prophets. Da after Daniel, you have all of those minor prophets. What are these guys trying to do? See, God sent some prophets to the northern kingdom and then sent some prophets to the southern kingdom to reach them. And here's the amazing thing. After they went into captivity and exile, God still had prophets speaking to them in their exile. So what's the story? The storyline is God reaching man. At every step of the way, God is trying to reach man. He tried to reach Adam, tried to reach Abraham, tried to reach Israel. He tried to reach them through the prophets, and they dissipated and went into exile. He is still reaching them. Are you getting the picture of the amazing love of God? This is the overarching theme of the Bible. God, who is holy and just, he really doesn't need anybody. He chose to pick us to be a blessing and to bless us because of his great love. Because he wanted to be loved voluntarily. And so that's what happened. They went into exile and during exile you had the prophets Ezekiel and Daniel. Ezekiel's prophecies were all written while they were in captivity. Jeremiah was also caught up in this thing. They dragged him. The Babylonians dragged Jeremiah along with them into captivity. So now next time you read the prophets, when Jeremiah is crying, you understand why he's crying. He's expressing the love of God to his people in a desperate situation. See, same thing with Daniel. God is speaking to the people and saying, you know what, now your situation looks desperate, but don't worry because I'm going to bring you back. Again, see the story continues. The thread is that you can never cut yourself off from God because God is always going to try to reach out to you. And so what happens is after Ezekiel and after the exile, God through Daniel promised that they would come back to the land after a period of time. 
And so Daniel, in his prophecies, he calculated and he said, seven weeks of 70, which is about uh, 70 years, and then 70 years of exile, excuse me, and then from that time on to the time of the Messiah would be about 490 years. So Daniel is calculating this in his head. You will see that all in the, in the book of Daniel. But the, the exile was supposed to last for 70 years, and after that, they were going to come back into the land. You start to see the storyline getting restored again. The story that was cut, was cut, was cut, was cut, was starting to be restored. And then after 400 years, they came back to the land of Israel, right? And here's the amazing part. So 400 years after the exile, the time of Jesus happened to come by. So you ask this question, well, why 400 years? They're called the silent years. That's the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? They call it 400 silent years. Why 400 years? Well, here's the amazing thing. If you notice, remember I talked about Assyria and Babylon? So in political circles, Assyria died, Babylon died. After Babylon came the Persians. In the book of Daniel, you'll see how the Persians took over from Babylon. And then the Persians were deposed. And after the Persians were deposed, there came the Greeks. Okay, the Greeks started to come in. And then after the Greeks, the next kingdom that arose was Rome or the Romans. This is important to understand because even though God used different nations, he always had the same purpose. The same purpose was to what? Restore fellowship because of his great love. So that fellowship was cut. So these kingdoms arose and fell. And in the 400 years, there was Greece and then there was Rome. The Greeks is where we get our judicial culture from. The Greeks, Aristotle, Plato, philosophy, judicial culture, the system of courts. All of that, the culture started to come with Greek. And of course, the language. Now, Greek, because it was so prevalent, the culture was so prevalent, started to become the lingua franca. That's the language that people spoke in that whole territory. Now you're starting to understand why the Bible was written in Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. And so you see that the culture was being set up for the Bible to be written in the language that was spoken by most of the world. You see, this is so amazing to understand. And so while that was being set up, the Romans came, and along with culture, they brought government, king, administration, power, military. These were the Romans. And so because of their power, they did what? They built roads trying to reach and conquer. After Alexander the Great, you had Rome come in. Now you have roads for travel. Again, God waited for those 400 years to set up a common culture, common language, and then access. See, the roads that were built by Rome enabled the gospel to spread everywhere throughout the known world. Isn't this amazing? So beautifully, right at the right time, it says in Hebrews, Jesus came in the picture so that the news about Jesus now could be conveyed throughout the world. So, after 400 years, Greeks, Romans, Jesus, Jesus is now in the picture. What happens after Jesus? We're going to move into the New Testament now with Pentecost, the formation of the church. Here's the amazing part about that. What happened in Pentecost is everybody from every nation around Israel was gathered in where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Right? So all the different nations of the world were gathered in Jerusalem. So the storyline continues. So through the nation of Israel, now through Jesus, through the disciples, through the church, you see how the pattern is still continuing? How we spread the love of God to the world. So in Pentecost, it was the opposite of what happened with Rome, right? In Rome, they created roads so that the thing could be taken out. But in Jerusalem, everybody came to Jerusalem so that they could take it from Jerusalem back to their own countries. Can you give me an example of this? The eunuch from Ethiopia. 
right? So he came and took the gospel back to Ethiopia, to the kingdom of Nubia, if you see in history. So we have these different people coming in to take the story and take it back with them. Along with that, we have the Apostle Thomas who came to India, all these different apostles who took the gospel to different parts of the world. The same story, the love of Jesus. So now, do you have any questions on the Old Testament? That's basically the storyline of the Old Testament. All through, there is this big effort from God to reach human beings, to show them his love. So as I said earlier, we move to the New Testament chronological books. And in the New Testament, we see that after Pentecost, you see different books being written. Mark was probably the first. And then you have all the other books. Then you have Luke traveling with Paul, where it says first mission, second mission, and third mission. They had all these missionary journeys. If you ever get a chance to look at a Bible map, look at Paul's journeys, you will see that he took repeated trips from Jerusalem all through the known world of Turkey, of Syria, of Greece, and finally Italy. So the gospel went westward, okay? Here's the amazing part that's happening till today. The gospel moved westward, Jerusalem to Greece, to Rome, to England, to America, which became missionary sending. And then it again circled the globe, went to the Far East, Japan, China, Southeast Asia, India. So the gospel is moving westward in that direction. So the missionary sending nations of before are now being replaced by other nations. This is the sovereign will and move of God because every nation has a part to play in the story of God. Isn't that beautiful? So today you and I are able to be missionaries to the world, just like it happened in Jerusalem. So this is the age of the church. And so the church age culminates with the coming of Jesus to reunite God with man. Isn't this a beautiful story? It started in the beginning where God and man were one, united, it got split, the devil tried to kill it, but God, through every fall and every snip and every disconnection, God kept working through fallen human beings, through fallen races and tribes, through fallen kingdoms, finally through Jesus, his son, through the church, and today through you and through me. We are the story. This is why the gospel, the book of Acts doesn't have a proper conclusion because the acts of the apostle stops almost like abruptly. Why? Because today we are, on behalf of the apostles, supposed to carry forward the same works that the apostles did. So we are that next generation, that next step. Isn't it exciting to know that you and I are called to be part of this book? We find our stories in this story. This is the most exciting part about reading the Bible. It is that we find our story in this story. And that's really the point of reading the Bible. It is God's story of interacting with man so that our story interacts with God. Amen? That's the big picture. Now, why is it so important that we have a good understanding of the Bible as one big story? I'll tell you why. It's because most of us grew up listening to stories, plural. So we know the story of David and, Go David and Goliath. We know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. We know the stories of Jesus. But this, this is important because you see how it's all connected. It's not many stories. It's one big story. These are all different parts in the story. So everything that you are reading is connected. And you have to see the thread if you look carefully, there's a scarlet thread that runs from the very first page of Genesis right to the very last page of Revelation. From the very beginning, God had already decided that Jesus was going to come and do this for us. And you see that red thread, red symbolically, running through the entire story. Now, I know some of you are reading Leviticus and enjoying it immensely. So I thought we could have a little bit of fun because I want to show you how Leviticus in the Old Testament is connected to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. 
And I want you to see the thread. So we're going to do something a little fun. Where is the... Here it is. So if you can, you're going to go to two places. You're going to go to Leviticus 16, and you're going to go to Hebrews 9. I'm going to see if I can talk, read, and put some notes up at the same time. We can do it. All right. So Leviticus 16. If you haven't yet read it, you will soon. And it's a great book to read because it's, it's a great chapter to read because it's talking about the Day of Atonement. All right? I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to look at a bunch of different things. First of all, in 16, chapter 16 starts by saying, The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Remember the two sons of Aaron who offered strange fire, right? And God shot them dead in a second. Don't you like the sound effects? Okay. So here, what happens? God is telling Aaron through Moses, saying, don't. Tell your brother Aaron, he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place. He is not to come. Okay. So first of all, look at this. Who was Aaron? He was the high priest. That's important. Okay. So Aaron was the high priest. And he, so everybody agrees that that's the highest you can go in terms of the priest. Okay. The high priest could not come near God into the holiest of holies anytime he wanted. God said, no, no, (laughs) you can't access me that easily. All right. Keep your place there. Switch quickly to the book of Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 4 for a quick second, then we're going to come back to 8, but just go to Hebrews chapter 4 quickly. What does it say in Hebrews 4 verse 16? Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Excuse me, I thought we were not supposed to go anytime we wanted to go. This was the high priest. Are you telling me the high priest could not go anytime I wanted to, but Gayatri can go anytime she wants? Yes, and so can you, and so can you, and so can all of us because of Jesus. So this is what the, the big, this big picture, I need you to keep it in mind because on one side, you have Old Testament, and on the other side, you have New Testament. What happened in the middle? Jesus came, and as a result of Jesus, now we can go boldly, any time to obtain grace and mercy. So when you read Leviticus, you need to sit there and go, whoa, the high priest could not go anytime he wanted, but I can because of the blood of Jesus. All right? So read Leviticus with, with things like this in mind. Let's go back to Leviticus for a second. All right, let's keep reading 16. Whoops, whoops, whoops. I need like three Bibles here so you don't have to flip. Okay. All right. So he says he can't come into the most holy place anytime because he's going to die. And then verse three, this is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Okay, he has to bring a bull and a ram. This is not all. After this, he actually needs to bring two goats with him, it'll tell him. It says he, okay, verse five, from the Israelite community, he used to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So why is he taking the bull? If he has to take two goats for the sin offering for the Israelites, why is he taking a bull? Oh, I'll tell you why he's taking a bull. Verse 6, Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering. Okay, he's the high priest. He's going to perform the sacrifice to remove the sins of the Israelites. But he himself is a sinner. So therefore, before he can do the sacrifice to remove the sins of the people, he has to remove his own sin. So Aaron has to come with a bull. bull. By the way, this is access denied, access granted. So Aaron has to come with a bull. All right. What about us? Let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews 9 quickly. I'm trying to keep many things here. Let's see. Hebrews 9. What's it say in Hebrews 9? No bulls and goats. No bulls and goats. Okay. So here it talks. Okay. Verse 12. Talking about Jesus. It says, Jesus did not 
enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. Jesus did not have to kill a bull for himself because he was the perfect son of God, right? So look at this. Aaron, the high priest, had to first offer a bull before he could even go in to perform the atonement ceremony for the people. Jesus, on the other hand, no, his blood is perfect. And because I am in Christ, I no longer, no, noble, his blood. There you go. You know what I'm talking about. And it's in red. I didn't plan that. I am in Christ. Therefore, I don't have to rely on a priest to do any kind of sacrifice for me. Jesus' sacrifice, it says, once for all is enough for me. See, when I read Leviticus, you got to read it to see the connection. Hey, if it weren't for Jesus, all of us would be sitting there in the market, lining up for sheep and goats and bulls all day long. How many times in a day do you sin? <laughs> right? Forget a job, forget raising a family. We'll be living there in that, uh, that cattle mark and we'll be fighting with each other. Hey, that bull is mine, man. I've been had, that's mine. No, 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 no. You don't know what I did yesterday. I need that bull to cover my sin, right? This is what we'll be doing with this. <laughs> Your Sharavna stores is not selling bulls and goats and whatever. I don't know where we'd be getting all of this stuff. Think about this. Because of what Jesus has done, how simple is it that we can just enter free access anytime we want? One more thing. Go back to Leviticus. I just want to point out one more thing here. Look at, so he gives him all the directions. He tells Aaron what he needs to do. And then all the way down, verse 34, Leviticus 16, verse 34, it says, this is to be a lasting ordinance for you. What does that mean? It means you're supposed to keep doing this. Well, how long am I supposed to keep doing this? Well, atonement is to be made once a year. Hey, are you kidding me? Every year we got to go through this? Every year, their sacrifice is being performed every day. Their sacrifice is being performed at all the special festivals. And then once a year, the high priest has to go into the holiest of holy and shed the blood of the goat, the bull for himself and the goat for the people on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant so that Israel is covered and God's wrath and anger does not come. Think about this. Every year, this has to happen, okay? Every year. Wow. What did we read in the book of Hebrews? Jesus performed the sacrifice once for all. Done. Now when you read, it is finished, it's finished. No more sacrifices. So when you read Leviticus, Imagine if you had the book of Hebrews and you're dancing around like this. You're like, whoa, I really get this. I get what is going on when God called the Israelites. He said, you have to worship me the way I want to be worshipped. I am going to give you rules and regulations. I am a holy God. You are a sinful person. If, you, if we are not careful, we cannot be together. For us to be together, I need to protect you. I need to give you sacrificial rules and regulations so you are covered so that I can come and be in your midst and I will be your God and you will be my people. That was the Old Testament. Jesus came along and said, they can't do it. That Old Testament, Old Covenant was faulty, it says in the book of Hebrews. No one can keep it. No one can keep themselves from sinning. All we keep doing is killing animal after animal after animal. And then every year the high priest has to go inside and do this, perform the atonement for the entire people. No, they need one perfect sacrifice. And the only one who's perfect enough to die for the sins of all mankind is Jesus. And so he comes in, he performs his sacrifice on the cross. And that's it. We are no longer covered and therefore have to be covered every year, we are cleansed forever because of the blood of Jesus. And when you put the two together like this, you're like, whoa, thank God for Jesus. Thank God we live under the new covenant. Amen? Look in the same chapter in Leviticus. There were two goats, right? Yes. What, were, what were you supposed to do? Verse 8 says, he used to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord 
and the other for the scapegoat. Hmm. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. What are we talking about? There were two goats. So they cast a lot. In fact, Jewish scripture tells us that they had to be exactly the same, same color, same size, same everything. And then they cast a lot. One of them is chosen for the Lord. The other one is set aside. So Aaron would place his hands over one of them, confess the sins, and then it's taken, slaughtered, and offered as a sacrifice. The crucifixion of Jesus, the Lamb of God that took the sins of all humanity. But then the other goat was taken, hands were laid on it, all the sins were confessed over it, and then it was set free. It was released, and it took away the sins of Israel. Jesus, three days, after three days, he resurrected, breaking the power of sin forever. Look at how these two goats represent the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. So when you're reading Leviticus, let the imagery come alive. All of what is being presented by the writer of Leviticus is what we are living today under the new covenant because of Jesus. In fact, the writer of Hebrews uses a tool that's actually Greek in origin. Um, Pastor Rami talked about that. He talked about how Greek culture was a big part of this time period when all of this stuff was being written. Plato, Aristotle, all these great writers, philosophers, and thinkers had taught at that time how to think. And Plato had this theory. He said all of what we experience on earth on a sensory level is just a shadow because the real thing is different. For example, I can experience an animal, but the real animal is different from my experience of it. That was Plato's thinking. He said, what we experience is different from the reality. The writer of Hebrews actually picks up this Greco style of thinking, philosophical thinking, and he says, you know that tabernacle? There's a picture of the tabernacle. If you get a chance, you can put it up. That tabernacle that Moses built after receiving instructions from God on Mount Sinai, there you go. That tabernacle is a shadow. The real temple of God is there in heaven. That tabernacle had a curtain that separated. Remember, there's three parts, right? Outer, inner, and then the holiest of holy. Had curtains separating. Some people could go into the outer courts. And then fewer people could go into the inner courts. And then only one person could go into the holiest of holy after he had offered the bull for his own sin. Because there was a curtain. That's the veil that we sing about, right? That veil was before. There is no access. Hey, you can't go. I can't go. It doesn't matter how much gold and silver you want. It doesn't matter what kind of ticket you have. You can't go in. I can't go in. There's a curtain. But then Jesus came. He took the sins of man. He died on the cross. He said, it is finished. And what happened? The veil tore. That system ended. There is no longer anything separating us because when that shadow was on earth, these priests, Aaron and the other high priests, would take the blood of animals and go shed it on that mercy seat. But Jesus, when he died, took his blood. Remember when he came out of the tomb, he told the women, don't touch me because I have to go to my father. What did he do? He went and he shed his blood on which mercy seat? This mercy seat? No, in heaven. Hey, we couldn't enter that tabernacle. Jesus said, forget about it. I want you to enter that tabernacle. Think about this. So when you read Leviticus, get the goosebumps. Feel awed. If you need to, close your book and get on your knees and pray and worship in that moment. Because today, you and I have access 
to go right into the throne room of heaven and say, Father God, not Yahweh, Jehovah, no, Father God. He, I relate to him as my heavenly father and he calls me his child because of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So I wanted to just give you a quick, because we talked about the Bible as one big story. I wanted you to see how the Old Testament and the New Testament are connected. Listen, we're going to take another quick break. We have to learn to read the Old Testament with Jesus always in our mind. We call it reading it Christologically. Always you read it with Jesus in mind. But when you come to the New Testament, always read the New Testament with the Jewish background in mind. Don't ever read anything in the New Testament without remembering that it was written to a Jewish audience. Jesus himself was a Jew. A lot of references being made are Jewish references. So go do a little bit of digging around. Use Google wisely. It's good. And figure out what the Jewish context. If you get a good study Bible, it'll tell you what is the Jewish context. So read Old Testament Christologically. Read the New Testament with, the, with an eye to the Jewish background. And that's how you really, really grab the essence of the Bible. Okay, we're going to take another quick five-minute break. And when we come back, we're going to start digging a little deeper. All right?